past couple months, we've been going over this letter, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we've learned many wonderful and great things that, um, from the things that Paul has told the church at Thessalonica. And again, I don't have the time really to go over everything. I will cover some of the things at the end. But we've now arrived at the last section of this first letter. And I've titled today's message, A Christian's Attitude and Conduct. Now what I've done is I've broken down verses 12 through 28 into two parts. The first part that we're going to be looking at will address the relation of the church body, those of us in the church, to its leaders and to one another. Attitudes in the church and to prophetic revelation. The second part that we're going to be going over We're going to be seeing Paul concluding this letter with some final words of instruction and encouragement. So the intent of this final section, what I hope this last section will inform or show you or teach you, is that all believers who are living a peaceful life not only pleases God, but it will also ensure that we'll achieve the great objective, the great objective of being blameless and not suffering harm at the last judgment. So before we get into God's word, before we get into this last section, let's pray and ask the Lord once again to speak to us. Heavenly Father, um, as now we prepare our hearts and minds to Read your word. I pray that you will speak powerfully, that you will soften hearts and minds to receive it, to understand it, and be moved and changed by your word. Lord, we know that you, your word can do some powerful and wonderful things. Save lives, change people. Restore relationships. So we ask that you do that today, this morning. I pray for those watching and listening that they will also be moved and that you will touch them in their own personal way as well, Lord. They will see you and hear from you the things they need to know and understand. And if they need to be saved as well. So now fill this room, Lord, with your spirit as we sit at your feet and hear what you have to say. Keep us safe. We love you. We praise you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. The Word of God says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, comfort, warn those who are idle, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything for all. For, all, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the spirit. Don't despise prophecy, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. 
There's a lot there that I'm going to try to unpack, and I hope that, that I hope that you'll if you take your notes, take notes. If but I hope that you'll really pay attention because there's a lot here that Lord that Paul wants to Paul is telling the Thessalonian church and. He wants to tell us as well as believers today. After responding to the questions the Thessalonians had regarding brotherly love, the destiny of the dead in Christ, and when the day of the Lord will be, Paul now reminds his readers of their present responsibilities as born-again believers, as, as believe, born-again believers in Christ. First, he gave them instructions concerning their relationship with their spiritual leaders. Now again, he's speaking here to born-again believers regarding their relationship to spiritual leaders, to their spiritual leaders. Now the Bible makes it clear that God has ordained leadership for the local church. Now, while it's true that Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 states that we're all one in Christ Jesus, there's also truth in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 7 through 16. There we're told that the head of the church, the head of the church, Christ, has given gifts to people and then given these people to the churches to exercise his will. The point being made is that just as the flo- a flock of sheep needs a shepherd, so a church family needs a leader. Now, because of the size of our church right now, we, it's just myself right in the church right now, we, it's just myself and Pastor Isaac, but we have had other leaders and we are considering others that have been here for a while in some leadership positions. But, um, but yeah, again, here again, he's speaking to the church in regards to the relationship to their leaders. In verses 12 and 13, Paul gave three exhortations to the church regarding the proper attitude towards their leaders. He first urges believers to recognize their leaders, which are described in three ways. Those who labor among you. Leaders are recognized not by their title, but by their service. A title is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But only if the title is true, And if the title describes what that person really is before God, before man. He also says that those leaders are over you in the Lord. Leaders are recognized as being over the congregation in a sense of ruling and providing headship as a shepherd is over the sheep. This describes a clear and legitimate order of authority. Leaders also, he says, admonish you. Leaders are recognized as those who admonish the congregation. To admonish means to caution or reprove gently. Basically, to warn. Paul's second exhortation to the church was to esteem their leaders very highly in love for their work's sake. In other words, church members are to esteem, value, and respect their leaders, not because of, again, their title or their personality, but because of the responsibilities before God. I really think that if the people sitting in most of the churches and 
America today and most of the good churches in America today, if they really understood what that responsibility entailed, that responsibility before God, if they knew what it entailed, they'd give those leaders really a higher level of esteem, a high level of esteem. Furthermore, that respect ought to also come from an attitude of affection in love for them. If a Christian can't esteem or, and love their pastor, they should either get on their knees asking the Holy Spirit to change their heart or go somewhere else and put themselves under a pastor they do esteem and love. As the pastor here of this church, I'm not one to, to brag. I'm not one to hold, let it get to my head. But I, as I said in the beginning, I do consider it an honor if you can... If you consider me your pastor, you know, I, I do. I, I think to myself, I'm, daily, I'm nobody. I'm just a you know, simple Mexican boy that grew up in South San Diego that really messed, did a lot of messed up things. And, you know, and, and the Lord has me here. He called me here, and I followed. And, you know, it, it, it is. I, I know and understand the responsibility, and I don't take it lightly. I know what that means, and I know what that entails, and it's a huge responsibility. And sometimes, as I said, that responsibility, it weighs heavily on, on me. And I, but I know, and the Lord knows deep in my heart, I want nothing more but to honor Him and to be seen and to be respected by you. I don't want to do anything that is going to lose, that I'm going to lose that respect. It's going to cause me to lose that respect from, at it, from you. But again, thank you, and, and I appreciate the love and respect and esteem that you've given me as the pastor of this church. And the love, and the love, again, that you've shown me the third exhortation to the church is to be at peace among yourselves. The idea here is to maintain rather than to initiate peace. Now, Paul has already stated that peaceful conditions existed in the Thessalonian church. But here he tells them to continue to have that peace See, church, the number one problem among Christians everywhere is the problem of not getting along with one another. On the opposite side of that, there's another problem, a behavior that's a threat to the church as well. That's a threat to the peace of that church. And that's the formation of cliques around human leaders. I've seen it in churches, and maybe you have as well. And when we started this church, my wife and I were talking, and we were like, we don't want to ever see that. And I made it a point to let her know, and I, I'm going to let, I've let Isaac know and those who come up in leadership that if they ever see that happening, we must put a stop to that as soon as possible because that, again, is so dangerous in a church and can threaten the peace of a church. You see, my friends, the reality is that all of us have enough of the flesh in us to divide and wreck any local church. However, only when we're empowered by the Spirit will we, will we be able to develop the love, brokenness, forbearance, 
kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness that are indispensable for peace. Let me now wrap up these two verses up by saying how important it is for you to accept, appreciate, love, and obey those who lead in the church. I'm also speaking to those watching, if you do belong to a church, wherever you're at, again, how important it is for you to accept, appreciate, love, and obey the leaders of those churches. A wise pastor knows he's made of clay and admits when he's wrong or when he needs counsel. In my own ministry and my own time as pastor here, I have personally benefited tremendously from the counsel and help from some of you, from some that are no longer here, from both men and women. I know that at times, again, I, I fall short. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes, but I'm learning. I'm growing. You know, even though I've been at this now, now uh, we've been at this now seven years, and you know, I still think the person I was seven years ago, the, the pastor I was, isn't the same person I am today. And I really believe that as I continue to grow, grow and continue to get this counsel and advice from you that I will be a different pastor seven years from now. But that's my aim too, is to grow, to grow as a leader, as a pastor, or all of you. Now, I benefited, I have benefited tremendously, and I do this because many of you are much more experienced and knowledgeable in areas that I know nothing about, that I'm unfamiliar with. Some of you have been elders, have been church leaders at really big churches. Some have, I know some have even pastored other churches. You know, some of you have counseled married couples. Some of you have dealt with tragedy, severe tragedy. And all of you, all of you have tremendous wisdom and knowledge that I may not be too familiar with. And again, I, 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 I do. I appreciate all of you, and it's one of the reasons why I come to you, because I know my limitations. I know that I don't know it all. Now, in spite of our limitations, my limitations, the leader's limitations, those of us who are leading should be respected and obeyed, unless it's obvious that we're out, out of God's will. I absolutely believe that when spiritual leaders of the church meet together, plan, pray, and seek to follow God's will, I'm certain that, God's, that God will rule and overrule in the decisions that are being made. But leaders, again, alone cannot do all the work of the ministry. So Paul added, added a second essential. In verses 14 and 15, Paul says that everyone, both leaders and members of the church, must minister to one another. Now in verse 14, he's probably addressing church leaders. And there he tells them how to deal with problem brothers. He begins by saying, warn those who are unruly. Let me see if I've got the right translation here. Verse 14. Warn those 
who are idle. That's what it says here in our Bible passage. In some of your passages, they may say unruly. And speaking of those who won't keep in step, but insist in disturbing the peace of the church by their irresponsible behavior. Here, they're unruly or the idol of those who refuse to work. They're the same as those described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, walking disorderly, not working, but being busybodies. While the loving atmosphere of the family encourage individual development, there are some things we all must do in the same way. If we don't have rules and standards in the family, we have chaos. However, rules and traditions must never be so overemphasized that creativity is stifled. As a parent, it's a joy to see my children blossom out of his or her own personality, talents out, I'm sorry, out with his, own, his or her own personality, talents, and ambitions. But it does, it hurts, as many of you know, as many of your parents know, to see a child rebel against the rules, abandon the traditions and standards, and think that this kind of lifestyle shows freedom and maturity. And it's this kind of attitude in the church family that causes arguments and splits. So again, as leaders, for those of you who desire to one day become leaders in the church, you're told to warn those who are ruly or idle. It also says there that Leaders are to comfort the faint-hearted. These are the quitters in the church family. They always look on the dark side of things and give up when the going gets tough. These people need encouragement. They need to be encouraged, which is the meaning of the word, which is the meaning of the word uh, comfort. Translated comfort in verse 14. Instead of scolding the the faint-hearted from a distance, leaders must get close to them and just speak heart to heart. Speak tenderly. Sit down with them and find out what's really going on. What's really happening. Have a sincere heart-to-heart conversation with them. We must also teach them that the trials of life will help to enlarge them and make them stronger in the faith. It also says there that leaders are to uphold the weak. Let me again tell you what it says here. Um, Verse 14, help the weak. So those who are spiritually and morally weak in the faith is probably the main idea here. It could also be speaking of those who are physically weak or maybe also financially hurting. Now, we have the strong and the weak in our church families today. Just as in our natural family, we have children who mature faster than others. How then should we handle them? How should we handle those who are weaker than us in the faith? With patience and with reassuring love. See, my friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's unfair and unwise to compare one child with another. For each one matures in his own time, and in his own way. 
We must take hold of those weaker believers and help them stand and walk in the Lord. This kind of personal ministry isn't easy. And so Paul added some wise counsel to encourage, to encourage us, to encourage leaders. Be patient with all. Show the grace of long-suffering when others tend to irritate and provoke. Maybe there's people here, maybe in your previous churches, you know of people who have irritated you and have provoked you. But here's the thing, church. It takes patience to raise a family. The weaker member, the weaker member who demands much help may one day be a choice leader. So never give up. Don't give up on them. Friends, true Christianity is shown by its ability to love and help difficult people. You shouldn't just find or go for those perfect people to minister to and to minister with. Yes, there's a place for that and they can help. But you should also look for those who maybe are weaker. So you can help them, encourage them. But you must also be patient, patient with them. We've seen, again, throughout our time here, many people that we've had to be patient with as well. There's different types of people, different types of personalities, different ways they've grown up and lived. Some have never walked into a church before, so their attitudes, behaviors are, you know, seem foreign. To some, it may be irritating. To some, their children may be irritating. But those are the people that we need to be patient with. We have to show them what the love of Christ is. Because maybe one day, you will be that example. They will remember you when they have to do the same for another person. And you don't want them to say, you know what, I was at this church and I was dealing with this person and they, you know what, they couldn't stand me. I was just so immature. I was just so young in the Lord. I, had they just been more patient with me, I probably would have been a different person right now. Let them have good memories of you. Verse now 15 seems to be addressing Christians, all Christians in general. There Paul forbids any thought, any thought of retaliation. The natural re reaction when we're attacked or hurt, is to strike back, to return tit for tat, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Got to get them back. But the Christian should be so in fellowship with the Lord Jesus, he will react, he or she will react in a supernatural way. In other words, he or she will instinctively show kindness and love to other believers and to the unsaved as well. So here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath, because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. 
For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Another thing to keep in mind is what, this, what, this, uh, what it says at the end of verse 15. If your motive is a desire for appreciation and praise, if your desire is to be looked upon by those in the church and be given pats on the back or be given a thumbs up and Maybe disappointed because it may not often may not often happen happen. There have been times I've served it, served in ministry for a very long time. And after leaving, it's just there's nothing. There's just hey, thank you, and that's it. Now, there was a time early in my Christian life and walk that I probably was disappointed. Can I realize that's it's okay. I'm not doing this. I'm not serving for them. I'm serving for the Lord. See, here's the thing. If your motive is, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake, if that's your motive, you will never be disappointed. You will understand and know that you're doing this for the Lord. The Lord alone, you're serving, you're ministering, and you may never see a pat in the back. You may never see any kind of appreciation. But you're serving. You're serving one another in love. You're serving your fellow Christian in love. And you're doing it for the Lord. Now, verses 16 through 18 now are dealing with the attitudes, are dealing with attitudes. And it, they're addressed to believers as individuals concerning their personal lives before God. Verse 16, rejoice. Or, an adi- or this is an attitude of joy. This can be the constant experience of the, of the Christian, even in the most adverse circumstances. What do you mean? Why? Why is that? Why can Christians still have an attitude of joy in the hardest of times? Because Christ, my friends, Christ is the source and the subject of the Christian joy. And Christ is in control of the circumstances. Now, incidentally, rejoice always is the shortest verse in the Greek New Testament. Even if Jesus wept is the shortest in the English. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Ceasing. Prayer should be the constant attitude of the Christian. If you're here, you're a believer, you're watching, you consider yourself a Christian, you ought to pray regularly, regularly when you're able to, on the spot, as needed, as the need arises, and enjoy continual communion with the Lord in prayer or by prayer. And lastly, verse 18 says, in everything give thanks to God. And this should be the Christian's native emotion. We're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. Now if you If you, as a Christian, really believe this, if you truly, truly believe this, you should be able to praise the Lord at all times, in all circumstances, and for everything, 
just as long as in doing so, you don't excuse sin. These three habits have been called the standing orders of the church. They represent the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. The words in Christ Jesus remind us that he taught us these things during his earthly ministry and that he was the living embodiment, embodiment of what he taught by teaching an example he revealed to us God's will concerning joy, prayer, and thanksgiving. Now, verses 19 through 22 seem to deal with the behavior of the assembly, of the church. To quench the spirit means to stifle his work in our midst, to limit and hinder him. Church, sin quenches the spirit. Traditions quench him. Man-made rules and regulations in public worship quench him. Disunity quenches him. Someone has said, cold looks, contemptuous words, silence, studied, dis studied disregard, go a long way to quench him. So does unsympathetic criticism. So now if we link verses 20 and 19, then the thought is that we quench the spirit when we despise prophecy. For instance, here, let me give you an example. A young brother may make some, I don't know, some off-the-cuff I don't know, statement in public, in public ministry, may say something that kind of just seems really strange, weird. By criticizing him in such a way to make him or her ashamed of his testimony for Christ, we quench, we quench the spirit. So you see, here's what, again, our brothers and sisters in Christ, the fire of the spirit must not go out on the altar of our hearts. We must maintain that devotion to Christ that motivates and energizes our lives. Rekindle the gift of God that is in you, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. And the verb there means stir the fire again into life. Apparently, Timothy had been neglecting his gift in 1 Timothy 4, 14. And so Paul had to remind him of this. And maybe you need a reminder as well. Rekindle the gift of God that is in you. Also, as individual believers and as a church, we must avoid extremes. The legalist and the formalist would put, out, would put the fire out while the fanatic would permit the fire to burn everything up. I agree and believe that it's important that we permit the Spirit of God to teach us the Word of God when we meet to worship. I've been in churches where there has been a night of worship or there's different names for that. I've seen many things in these times. And but here's the thing, sharing is good. If you have something relevant to share from the word. But in these meetings, in these worship gatherings, worship services, I've seen things that weren't only unspiritual, but anti-spiritual has to be order. There has to be, has to be coming from the word of God. So the point here 
is that we all need to be careful of not allowing a false spirit to lead us astray. For this reason, again, we must follow the Word of God by testing all things. And hold fast, be unmovable to what is good. Not only should we avoid quenching the Spirit and avoid and ignore false prophecies, but also, as Paul broadened his warning, abstain from every form of evil. Now this verse isn't primarily warning people to abstain from any kind of sinful association with the outside world, to separate from false prophets within, and to reject their erroneous messages. It's, there's a truth in that, but it's not primarily warning people about that. Again, it's about abstaining, staying away from anything that is going to cause you to sin, that may appear bad, that will ruin your testimony, that will ruin the image of the church. That's why we say, again, just be careful when you go out there, when you you know, when you're representing this church or any church, be careful with your behavior. You don't want to be at a, at a bar or at a, anywhere that people are going to say, oh, that, is that what the Christians there do at that church? You know. Again, be careful. Be careful about what you do and where you're at. Abstain from every form of evil. If the Bible says that it's evil, listen. Don't play with fire. Stay away. Abstain from it. Now, again, what may only appear to be bad also falls under this warning. However, and here's a quote from, a, from, a, from an author. While believers should abstain from actions which knowingly offend others, it's not always possible to abstain from everything which may appear evil to a narrow and foolish judgment. People will always criticize. People will always have something to say. But again, it's better just to stay away from those areas, those things that are people are just going to cause or find a way to criticize you all right so now this last section here paul will cover some more instructions and cover a few more instructions and we'll also see the closing of his closing words in this letter so let's pick up in verse 23 first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us also. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord Let this letter be read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, Paul was aware that the expectations to meet the requirements that he just previously mentioned are pretty high. But here now, he expresses his sincere desire that God would enable his readers, us, to attain them. So to encourage his readers, Paul highlighted God's ability to produce peace. As I already mentioned, the church at Thessalonica had come to experience peace through the preaching of the gospel. And so when Paul wrote this letter, they were actually doing that. They were enjoying peace with one another. 
The God who had given them that peace became their adequate resource for the future as he had been in the past. So knowing this, Paul prayed that the God of peace would sanctify, set them apart, would sanctify them to himself in every area of their lives, not just a part of their lives, but in every area of their lives. Just to be clear, Paul didn't mean they could attain complete sanctification this side of heaven. Folks, that's impossible. It can't be done this side of heaven. He also prayed his readers would be preserved blameless in view of and until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ for his saints. Also, although Paul spoke of the Christian as spirit, soul, and body, man is described elsewhere as having two parts, body and spirit in James chapter 2 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And in Matthew chapter eight, uh, 10, verse 28, it's also described as a body and soul. So rather than teaching that people have only three parts, Paul here was probably using the three terms to identify the three aspects of the personhood he wished to emphasize. The spirit is the highest and most unique part of man that enables him to communicate with God. The soul is the part of man that makes him conscious of himself. It's the seat of his personality. The body, of course, is the physical part through which the inner person expresses himself and by which he is immediately recognized. Spirit, the soul, and the body. Paul was saying then that he desired the Thessalonians, that the Thessalonians would be kept blameless by God in their relationship, in their relationships with him, in their inner personal lives, and in their social contacts with other people. He goes on to say in verse 24, that the same God who calls a Christian will perform this by the Holy Spirit. And this is the only way the Holy Spirit who indwells them. Now, according to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, God is faithful to bring a, to bring to completion the work he has begun in believers. It also says in Galatians that God doesn't save a person by grace and then leave, leave him alone to work out his Christian growth by works. What this tells us is that, is that God calls and justifies by grace. He calls and justifies by grace. He sanctifies by grace as well. This here is known as positional, positional sanctification. Then there's also practical sanctification, a daily dealing with our sins and a growth in holiness. In the end, when all things come to an end, this, all this will culminate in perfect sanctification when we see Christ and become eternally like him. This expectation of seeing Jesus Christ, our Savior one day, it ought to move us. It ought to move you as a Christian. It ought to motivate you to holy living. As Paul closes his letter, he asks them for prayer in verse 25. This shows us that he never outgrew the need for prayer, and neither should you. If you need prayer, ask for it. No matter how mature you are in the faith, ask for prayer. See, it's a sin to fail to pray 
fellow believers. Next, in verse 26, he asked that all the brethren be greeted with the holy kiss. Holy kiss. Now, this is a controversial one, and I'll try to unpack it here. Now, at the time, this was an accepted mode of greeting. In some countries, this still takes place. It's still customary for men to kiss men and women to kiss women, either with one kiss or two kisses on the cheek, on each side of the cheek. But let me also say this. The kiss was not instituted by the Lord as as prescribed, as a prescribed form of greeting or even taught by the apostles as obligatory. So in other words, the Lord never mentioned it. And also, the apostles never really said, this has to be done. You have to do it like this. The Bible wisely allows for other modes of greeting and cultures where kissing might lead to other things, other thoughts, other behaviors that could be sinful. The Spirit of God seeks to guard against such irregularities by insisting the kiss, the kiss, it must be holy. In other words, it must be pure. Without any bad motives, bad thoughts. So again, I know I'm not expecting all of us to greet one another with a kiss. No, I know that some, you know, some people even feel uncomfortable with hugs, and that's fine. You know, I'm a hugger. And maybe some of you aren't, and that's okay. And I don't mind if you tell me, hey, you know what? You know, know your role. Come on, keep your distance. No, I, I'm okay with that. You know, I know I, I get the hints, I know, and I respect that. But again, I'm not just going to, I don't expect all of us to just walk up to a brother and sister in Christ and just, in Christ and just start kissing them in the cheek. No, you know what? In our culture and... We give bro hugs, you know, and we give handshakes, weird, all kinds of different handshakes, you know. Women do it differently, too. They have their modes of greeting. But, you know, again, there has to be respect for the culture as well. And if there is ever a kiss, and it is, is, is allowed, it must be holy, a holy kiss. Well, in verse, 20, verse 27, the apostle then solemnly charges that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. Now, many different reasons have been, suggesting for why, for, have been suggested for why Paul added this phrase at the end of this letter. Now, since this was his first letter, there was of yet no established custom of public, there was yet no established custom of the public reading of his letters, and he wanted to make sure the practice was established. Since the letter was a substitute for his personal appearance or presence, Paul didn't want any disappointment at his absence to dampen the spread of the letter. Paul wanted to make sure that the church heard the letter firsthand and not through intermediaries who might misstate his message. Or perhaps Paul feared that people would look up passages in this letter that spoke to the issues that interested them the most and ignore the other parts. But regardless, two points should be noted here in this verse. Paul invests the letter with authority, with the authority of the Word of God. The Old Testament was read publicly in synagogues. Now this epistle, this letter, will be read aloud in the churches. And secondly, the Bible. The Bible is for all Christians. Not for some inside circle or privileged class. All of its truths are for all the saints. Notice also that verses 25 through 27 have three keys to a successful Christian life. Number one, prayer. 
Number two, love for fellow believers, which speaks of fellowship. And three, reading and study of the word. Finally, in verse 28, we have Paul's um, characteristic close. He opened this letter with grace, and now he closes it with the same theme. To the apostle, to Paul, Christianity is grace from beginning to end. That should be our attitude as well. Christianity is grace from beginning to end. Now, as we leave this letter, as we leave 1 Thessalonians, I want to pause for a moment. I'll go over these quickly for a moment to reflect on some of the major areas of, of emphasis we've seen. First of all, salvation is a result of divine election and is ultimately the work of God. Here, this here is the basis for our security as Christians. Number two, sanctification is the goal of our salvation. We were saved to become holy and thus prepared for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification is a lifelong process that involves the purification of every part of our humanity. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the finish line for people of faith in Jesus. It's also a shocking surprise for those who are lost. Christians should eagerly anticipate and watch for the second coming. It's then that the dead in Christ will be resurrected to be eternally united with Christ, with fellow believers. The wicked, however, they don't see the end coming and continue to live in a sort of drunken state of indulgence, of self-indulgence, feeling secure in their sin because they believe that judgment isn't coming. Number four, suffering for the sake of Christ sake of Christ is part of the normal Christian life. Paul and his fellow team and his team of uh, Silas and Timothy suffered in bringing the gospel to Thessalonica. They taught the Thessalonians that trusting in Jesus, it's going to bring persecution. Thus, the Thessalonian saints became kindred spirits with the Jewish brethren in Judea. You know why? Why they were able to connect? Because they both suffered persecution at the hands of their kinsmen. Number five, God has designed the church and designated its functions in a way that best equips it to withstand persecution and opposition in this life and to also prepare Christians for the glory of God's presence for all of eternity. Multiple levels of church leadership and the, decentralized, and, and the decentralization of ministry best promote sanctification and perseverance in the midst of opposition and persecution. Number seven, scriptures, the scriptures, my friends, are essential for the spiritual health and growth of the church. If you want to grow as a Christian, read the scriptures. If we want to grow as a church, we read the scriptures. And this is why I read the scriptures. And I just don't, I first read the scriptures and then go over it. Just don't ignore it or skip through something. No, I read the scriptures. And we, that's why we also ask that you have a Bible with you so that you can read along as well. Now, there is a benefit, again. I know some of you use different translations, but there is also a benefit to using the same translation here within the church. You know, again, we all have different study Bibles that at home, but when we all have that same um, Bible in front of us, it, it makes it easier for us to communicate with one another. 
Again, I'm not, I'm not a big stickler about it. Uh, it's not a demand or anything like that. It's just, I, I think that we can all just, we all can able, we're all able to read the same words, same sentences, same phrases without any confusion. And lastly, number seven, what we see in this letter is that grace is the common denominator of the Christian life. Our salvation, your salvation and sanctification are in the end God's work. It's a work in which you participate. It's not a work in which you predominate. Our works as believers are the result of His work. Our work as a believer are the result of the work that Jesus already did on the cross. And what did He do? He hung there and died to forgive you of your sins. He did all the work already. You don't have to. If you're in a religion or a denomination that says that you have to do all these things in order to be saved, in order to go to heaven, that's not what grace is. And it takes away the work that Jesus already did on the, on the cross. He's done it all. You just have to sit at his feet and, and now just listen to him, obey him, love him, trust him. Allow him to change your heart, to remove those things in your heart that you're still holding on to. And he will. He will change you. Again, sanctification. He will make you more like him. And that should be the goal of each and every one of us, to be more like him. This moment, I... I want to speak to those who have never given their life to the Lord, who don't, have, have never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, who now see that and understand that their spiritual condition is, there is none. It's dead. Well, I want to invite you to the cross in order to be born again, in order to have life have life more abundantly. As I said, my friends, Jesus died for you. He's freed believers. You believe He's freed and wants to free you from the shackles of sin and death. And all you have to do is come to Him and surrender yourself to Him. If that's what you wish to do today, if that's what you wish to do this morning, again, I invite you to the cross. And if you've never prayed before, if you've never, don't know how to pray uh, and not sure what to pray, let me lead you in a prayer to do that. So again, wherever you're at, if it's safe, close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know and admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you right now to forgive me. I truly believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Therefore, I repent of my sins. I turn from them and confess you, you alone, as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now, Jesus, I ask you to fill me with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, so that he may help guide me, teach me, and fill me in my new born-again life. 
in your name. Amen. If you've prayed that, reach out to us. Let us know. We want to help you in your next steps of your Christian, new Christian life. We're excited for you. There's a celebration going on in heaven, and we want to help you again in your next steps. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being with us here. We hope that uh, this week you'll be blessed, that you'll be a blessing to others. Have a great week. Have a great day. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.